Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, a podcast where scientists and engineers come together to chat about a common interest, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Antonia and in this episode I'm joined by Laura and Anika to talk about fusion and how it's portrayed in pop culture and the news. To start off with, Laura, what do you know about fusion? And how does it relate to your life? I guess it's worth giving a definition of what I understand it to be in this context. So we're talking about the fusion of atoms to create energy or electricity, I guess. And this is, to me, this is a very future seeming technology. It's not something we currently have, although people have been researching it for a long time. But it also comes up in popular culture quite a lot. And I remember it clearly featuring in one of the Spider-Man films from about 20-ish years ago with Tobey Maguire. Uh, I was watching the new Spider-Man film in the cinema over Christmas. It came back. Fusion was being talked about again. Doc Ock returned in the latest Spider-Man film. And he, he says he wants the power of the sun in the palm of his hand. I remember watching Spider-Man 2 way back when. I was working in the cinema at the time as well. And thinking that what actually happens in the films is probably quite far from reality. But that is the limit of what I know about fusion. That's great that 20 years later, it's come back round. And would you say that fusion has changed that much in that 20 years? Well, we luckily have uh, Anika who can talk about this a little bit more. So Anika, what's your uh, perspective on A, nuclear fusion and also Spider-Man films? I'd like to start off by saying I cannot believe it's been 20 years since that film. That's just made me feel really old and quite depressed. My perspective on fusion, so I actually work in fusion so I should start with that so I'm obviously quite biased I have not been working in it for 20 years I was still in school at the time when Spider-Man 2 came out but even in the 10 or so years I've been working in Fusion there's been a huge amount of development and it's very in at the moment there's a lot of you know press attention there's a lot of companies and a lot of private investment that has never really happened before it's always been as Laura put it in the future there's always a joke it's 30 years away or we'll get it when we need it that's what people always say so starting to see a bit of a change from it being purely kind of scientific to kind of having more industrial involvement over the last few years whether that will result in you know acceleration in the deployment of fusion is but uh, it's exciting for sure. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot to unpack. So maybe let's start at the beginning of what is fusion. So I heard that fusion was first researched in 1920 when people observed that the mass of atoms, particularly hydrogen atoms, were heavier than helium atoms. And that was when they applied Einstein's theory of M equal E equals MC squared. Yeah, spot on. So yeah, it was interesting is that it was actually like discovered before fission was. So traditional nuclear powers are fission reactors where they split atoms to liberate energy because there's a mass difference between the atoms that you produce compared to the reactants. In a simple term, fusion's the opposite. So as Laura mentioned, we stick them together, also liberating energy by the same kind of uh, E equals MC squared process that you mentioned. This is something that happens naturally in the sun. This is the best working fusion reactor that we we have in our solar system. So we have fusion of light atoms in there, and that's how the sun releases so much energy. As Dr. Octopus mentioned in Spider-Man, we're trying to recreate the sun on Earth, or as he says, in the palm of his hand. I think a lot of the fusion reactors in in Hollywood are quite small compared to the, the size of the experimental ones we're working on in in real life i don't think any of them would fit in someone's hand or even in a bit a small building but yeah so they're, so they're quite large beasts at the moment you're saying that a fusion reactor can't fit into palm of someone's hand why is that what makes it so difficult to actually make it into a little pocket-sized reactor if you can imagine this is what's happening in the sun so the temperatures we need are pretty hot in order to sustain a fusion reactor. So normally a fusion reaction relies on three main things, which is the temperature of your kind of uh, atoms you're fusing fusing together, the density of them, and how long then you can hold them kind of close enough for them to interact. Because I don't know if you remember, like likes opposites attract and likes repel, like from your high school science. It's the same with your nuclei. So if you can imagine your nuclei positively charged, so to get them to fuse together, they have to overcome that repulsive force. And in order to do that, they have to either be very, very hot or very, very close together in order to achieve that. The sun does that because it's got a lot of pressure and also very high temperatures, like maybe 10 million degrees. We can't create those same pressures to get the atoms close enough on Earth. So we actually need to go to temperatures even hotter than the center of the sun. So we're talking about like 100 million degrees Celsius in this thing called a plasma, which is like a superheated gas with all these positive nuclei and then the electrons kind of floating together in in this soup. So we have super, super hot plasma. Then we need to confine that in some way and hold it together so that 
they can kind of fuse. There's different ways of doing that. I could go into a lot of detail, but maybe it's too much. I don't know. So one way is with lasers and another way is with magnets. Magnets are the ones that are kind of most commonly used at the moment, but there's a lot of work with the lasers as well. So you kind of need to hold this plasma in a device maybe with magnets holding it all in place. It's super, super hot inside. The magnets you have are super, super cold. They're super cooled, super conducting magnets, which is basically almost absolute zero. So in a typical fusion reactor called a tokamak, which is like this donut shaped device, in the space of a few meters, you're going from almost absolute zero to 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. So it's quite a challenge <laughs> to have that, that kind of temp. Nowhere else in the universe has such temperature gradient other than a fusion reactor. So it's kind of crazy. There's like a huge huge challenge in holding the reaction in place the materials the engineering to to have kind of container that can hold it all and that's probably the easy bit we still also can't get more energy out than we put in because holding that reaction in there getting it to kind of self-sustain itself is a real challenge but Nika what kind of materials could you use so to refer back to Spider-Man 2 Doc Ock uses these AI controlled robotic arms to control it. Is there any robotic arm that we could use to hold the reactor together or start the reaction? Nothing to hold the reactor. It's all kind of your steels and things like this. You build almost like a giant vacuum vessel with steels and other materials that can hold it in place. But robotics are really important in fusion. And there's been a huge advancement in the terms of robotics that we use because sometimes there's certain places where you can't go into, it's not safe for people to go into. And so they need to do remote handling much like the, the fission industry or replace components. So there's been huge advancements of robotics and there's even the ones, I've forgotten what they're called, but it's like you can just move your hand and the robot moves. Do you know what I'm talking about? So it's like you have a headset and then you move your hand and the robot moves in the same way as your hand. Oh, like so it's something in the headset that's sort of tracking what your hand does and mirroring. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's been huge like advancements in the robotic technologies for fusion reactors, but not robots to hold the reaction as such, but more about kind of moving bits of, uh, you know, moving components and things like that. I got the impression that whoever was doing the writing of the science bits for Spider-Man 2 just kind of combined them several different technologies from the nuclear industry and just stuck them all together. Because I think Doc Ock just mentioned that it's it's impervious to temperature or something like that. Those uh, the octopus arms that he has. I'm like, what? How do you make anything impervious to temperature? Yeah, fusion literally needs high temperatures and magnets to hold it. So it really needs those things rather than not being impacted by them. At and all. I got the impression that the reason we're not using the tech yet, I'm aware that you have to get more energy out than you're putting in. And I always thought it was because the confinement was a difficult part. But from what you said, it sounds like it could be more the temperature differences. So is, is there one big challenge to look at or is it all those many different challenges that you mentioned? There's millions of challenges. So yeah, the confinement time is still an issue, Laura. It's still, I think that's an issue. Achieving a burning plasma. Now we have to heat the plasma to get the reaction going and to keep it going. The idea is that it can kind of self-sustain itself in the future if we can, but we're not at that stage yet. Additionally, huge materials challenges in terms of complex, very complex geometries, regardless of whatever reactor design you're going for. The geometries are crazy. You have kind of joins between dissimilar materials that have very different properties, which creates weaknesses in your structures. On top of that, you have it gets in the the fuel so another thing that in a fusion reactor on earth we want to use two isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium deuterium is pretty readily available tritium at the moment a lot of it comes from kandu reactors so a little link with the fission industry but the hope is that in the future we can breed the tritium within the reactor itself which i think dr octopus talks about maybe he doesn't i don't he mentioned know. self-sustaining but doesn't really explain and then starts going to like harmonic harmonics and stuff like finding some frequency that's the same as the atoms or something which i didn't quite understand I think that's just Hollywood, Hollywood talk. <laughs> but in terms of the self-sustaining, the plan is that the neutrons that are generated from the tritium, tritium reaction can interact with lithium, which would be in the wall of your reactor, generating more tritium, which could then be used as more fuel. So that's the plan of it being self-sustaining. So if we're starting with tritium and what was the other one? Deuterium. What's deuterium? Is it one proton, two neutrons, and then we're adding on one proton, three neutrons, and then we get lithium? Or have I got that wrong? So yeah, we have the deuterium and tritium, which is two, what, one proton for both of them, and then two neutrons, three neutrons. They fuse together, producing helium. So that's two neutrons and two protons, plus another neutron, which is highly energetic. So it's a, like 14 MeV neutron. So that highly energetic neutron that's generated can then interact with lithium in order to produce tritium. That's the theory. It's not been proven. Ah, okay, because when they mentioned self-sustaining, I assume that you fuse these atoms together and then that you can somehow get them to fall apart again even though they're meant to create fairly stable isotopes, I think. 
No, I think it's more that the reaction keeps going without any additional heat being injected into it. And then on top of that, you can generate more fuel from the neutrons that are generated, I think. It's also been a long time since I've seen this movie. I don't know if that's what they're about, but I feel those fit in the bill of self-sustaining when it comes to fuel. To be fair, in Spider-Man 2, there's pretty much just this, he places this ball of tritium in the middle of this this cage, essentially. And from what I've seen of, you mentioned um, tokamak reactors, I think. They've got this like big sort of, like a, a hollow donut, really. And all the magnetic confinements around the outside of that donor, right? Yeah, exactly. It's very different to what was in Spider Man 2. So, is this the kind of thing that we are looking at in the, the fusion world where we're getting deuterium, tritium to get self sustaining? Or is there an alternative that people have been looking at? So, deuterium, tritium is normally considered because I think it's got the highest cross section, like it's the most, the reaction that's most likely to occur and it's easiest to achieve for energy production reasons on Earth compared to other similar ones. People have looked at other ones, so it's not to completely discount them. I think there could be other ways of of doing it, but this is the one that's most heavily researched. Uh, So, when you say cross section, that means I I think of that as to capture neutrons. Is that right, though? It's it's, it's a probability of it being able to capture. The probability of it of them fusing together, basically. Yeah, that's what I meant when I said that. So something that people often talk about as well is it, you're talking about it almost being like a perpetual machine of energy. Is that realistic? Is it once we get it going, is there no other issues in the world? We've got free, cheap energy forever because that was what everyone seems to sort of talk about. Nuclear fusion is the holy grail to all of our energy issues. So I think it's a mistake to refer to any energy as as a holy grail. I don't think there's any such thing. Every energy source has its downsides, right? We're a very high energy intensive society. Anything we use is going to have an impact on the environment along the way. In terms of having it run forever, I think China broke the record for the longest ever fusion reaction last week. And I think it was 17 minutes. I might be wrong. Um... (laughs) But that, that's a big deal in the fusion community. That's really impressive. But clearly 17 minutes is not going to power London or power, you know, all these major, major cities. So we're still quite a, a while away. Uh, I don't think it's impossible, but that gives you kind of the scale of what we're working with in terms of the length of time the reaction can continue. And that wasn't a like a net energy reaction. That was just a fusion reaction. So it's actually pretty easy to do a fusion reaction, whether it's between deuterium and deuterium or other kind of light elements. That's pretty straightforward. They've been doing that for years. It's just doing it for a long time and doing it in a way that is actually going to produce energy is a real challenge. So I think, yeah, we're we're still a a while away. Right. So that record in China, they were still putting more energy in than they were getting out for the 17 minutes yeah i believe so otherwise i think it would have been i think everyone would have gone crazy ah. if it wasn't the case <laughs> once they got that 17 minute how long did it take to set up for the next run you know like you've got 17 minutes we did it and then how much longer would it take to get that tritium fuel back in and resetting everything getting back up to that temperature and pressure as well because i imagine like once it happened and then it was like okay we need to shut it down it's not sustaining anymore so I don't think they even used tritium. I think it was deuterium, deuterium. I may be wrong, please. Yeah, I can't remember. So they probably didn't even use tritium. I'm guessing they used deuterium, deuterium, because I think only JET at the moment, which is in the UK, is operating with deuterium and tritium to test the reaction. So I think that was just deuterium, deuterium. I don't know when their next pulse would have been. I assume that it wouldn't take too long, but again, I'm not sure. So when it became unsustainable for 17 minutes, I'm, I'm guessing that that didn't mean it was about to explode and we have to shut it down like it did in Spider-Man. It was just the, the reactions kind of stopped and it fizzled out you couldn't blow up a fusion reactor if you tried it's like so difficult to do the question of it blowing up exploding would never happen it would just literally as you said Laura just fizzle out when it does it doesn't work it just shuts off that's fusion that's what I figure I guess that's either because the confinement goes or the temperature's not right or I, you, I guess you can poison the reaction or I say poison the reaction it's probably not yeah because if you get erosion of your of your wall and there's impurities in your plasma your plasma just switches off it switches off so easily <laughs> It's like so difficult to keep it going. That's why it's really, really safe from that uh, perspective. So, you know, with like fission reactions, you can almost get like a runaway, can't you? Is that something that happens in fusion? Or maybe I'm wrong, Laura. Maybe I shouldn't say fission has runaway reactions. I think either. most fission reactors now were designed so that that can't happen. It will just end the reaction somehow without any particular problems. And fusion, it just can't happen. It's nothing to do with like the design. It's just it won't run away. Just won't, it won't work. <laughs> it's, 
if the conditions aren't right, it just won't happen. That's I'm, I'm guessing whoever wrote Spider Man 2 was like, oh, it's the sun. Let's just sort of lean on that analogy. Let's make something that looks like the sun. This little really hot ball in this fairly pretty described confinement ring. But it, it looked like a little sun. Like the pictures you see of the sun, it was um, orangey, wasn't it? And I also suspect it wouldn't look like that in real life. So I mentioned plasmas. Plasmas do have a, a colour depending on, you know, what elements you have in there. A lot of the pictures you see will be like purple. So you'll see like a purple plasma inside of the tokamaks. But yeah, it doesn't look like the sun at all. Although yeah. we do use that as an analogy that we're trying to build the sun on Earth. That's a real quote from fusion scientists. <laughs> the whole basis for Spider-Man 2, nothing to do with the tentacle arms that take control of him and start making him do things that he shouldn't. <laughs> But that's a different technology that went wrong. That that wasn't nuclear fusion. No, shots. that was AI you know, and nanowires. Like, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Check out our nanobots episodes just before Christmas. Yeah, that did make me wonder. Based on our episode, what do those nanowires do, and what are they made of, and and why is even using nanowires? But that's a different podcast episode. Uh, but so you said that not many people are using tritium, and Doc Ock does. Every time he says he can't just call it tritium, he has to call it precious tritium every single time he mentions it. In the <laughs> <laughs> you said that's because it probably it can only really be gotten from other parts of the nuclear industry at, at the moment but that will change once they develop this breeding technology and they're actually researching that in ITER which is being built in the south of France so that's like a massive experimental reactor that involves collaborations with the EU, US, Japan, Korea, China, India, Russia, should be seven, <laughs> I might have missed someone out, sorry. sorry if I missed you out, but they're all working together and one of the concepts they're trying to prove is this tritium breeding technology. Ah. So that if it's producing helium, what happens to the helium? Can that poison the reaction? In materials and causes a lot of issues, Laura. It's, uh... So is that just waste that they have to do something with? I mean, it's fairly in a benign gas, right? Well, you say it's benign until it forms bubbles and all sorts of weird... Na- so helium can interact with tungsten, which is what I work on, and produces this wild nanostructure on the surface of your material. And it turns the tungsten black. So if you can imagine a black metal, so it's completely optically black. And then people were scared that this might erode and then poison the plasma or cause issues. But actually, there's been a lot of research into, could we use this? Even though it's, it might be an issue in a fusion reactor, could we use it for photocatalysis or for like solar panels and things like that? Because it's an optically black metal. So one man's tries is another no one man's <laughs> trash is another man's trash <laughs> or person sorry yes i should be uh inclusive yeah i'm not going to say it again i'm just going to confuse myself but you know what the, I mean. you've got neutrons flying around in there as well right and if you're confining stuff with magnets you're not going to confine the neutrons are you nope so they also damage your material <laughs> it's another issue they go straight through and they interact with your material they can cause transmutation so your materials can start as one thing end up being something else and they can cause a lot of damage yeah most of what i know about neutrons is they make things that are radioactive and then you've got radioactive waste to deal with yeah so to be fair the fusion industry have said they want to try and use reduced activation materials so they deliberately try and use elements that will produce as little radioactive waste as possible however with 14 mev neutrons you are going to get stuff getting activated i think it won't be high level it'll be low level but i think there will be a significant amount Uh, how do you think it will compare to the conventional nuclear industry's waste Good question. A lot of the waste that's been developed from the nuclear industry currently, that's come from really old technology reactors and newer reactors can be more efficient and could produce less waste and you can recycle the waste as well if you so choose. So yes, I think that's a really difficult one to figure out what the differences would be. I think we won't have high level radioactive waste from fusion just because of, you know, the tritium has a very short half life. So I think all of our waste will come from the interactions of the neutrons with the structure. So if they can find materials that are, you know, reduced activation and don't, you know, have uh, become so so radioactive, then we can reduce it. But I think, yeah, I think there will be quite an amount of low, low level radioactive waste is my prediction but i'm not i don't specialize in this so please take that with a, a grain oh, well, you mentioned that there's a lot of development going on it's changed a lot since spider-man 2 was in the cinemas compared to the latest spider-man film and what i found quite interesting was that when doc ock is saying i want the prior sudden palm my hand and then uh spoiler alert spider-man fixes what was wrong with his octopus arms and he's like and the the scientist that is using his knowledge for the good of humankind now then spider-man just hands in one of tony stark's arc reactors like there you go power of the sun in the palm of your hand and it, it kind of <laughs> illustrated how the technology could change in a few decades but I mean, as you said at the start the, the fusion devices can't possibly be that small because of the technology you'd need the heat and the confinement and whatever else 
So I said that maybe not the size of your hand, but actually there is a lot of work on these high temperature superconductors, which are being developed at the moment. So things like Rebco. So I believe there's a company in the UK called Tokamak Energy. And then also in the US, Commonwealth Fusion Systems are working with MIT on the Spark and Arc reactors. I think they chose it to link to, to Iron Man. So they're using these high temperature superconductors, which means you can operate the superconductors instead of almost at absolute zero, operate at a whopping, I want to say 77. Liquid hours. nitrogen temperature. <laughs> liquid nitrogen so it's not actually high temperatures to you and me it's still freezing but a lot higher than absolute zero so for the superconduct uh, the the low temperature superconducting magnets was that liquid helium or what what is it that they use to to make those low temperature because like liquid nitrogen is pretty cold to most people yeah No, that's a good question, actually. I don't know what they're called. By. I think helium sounds reasonable, but I, I'm not sure. But with those, your reactor has to be a lot larger, whereas with the high temperature ones, they have a capacity to be smaller. So the reactor could potentially be a bit smaller with these high temperature superconducting. It'd be interesting, it's probably slightly outside this episode, but there's a lot of talk about small modular reactors. Yes. Which, they're fission instead of fusion, but the idea is that they're small and self-contained, so they could be underground close to population centres maybe, and there, wasn't, there wouldn't be a, much risk of anything untoward happening to that population. I yeah. wonder what the size comparison would be between that and fusion reactor. So it's interesting you've mentioned that because recently Bayes, which is the UK Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, have shortlisted three potential designs for advanced modular reactors. So similar to the SMRs, which which you've mentioned, but I think they're just new concepts. Two of them are fission concepts. One of them is a fusion concept, Mm. which is wild. I think that's so amazing and very exciting. So, yeah. Ah, go. So the UK government is getting behind some of this technology. and Yeah, saying, they're really backing. Go, go do stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do wonder though, because the, the pots of money that the government give out are probably quite small in comparison to what you need to do all this research and actually make a viable technology. So yeah. I, I wonder how much difference that will make. It is encouraging though. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the issue with any type of nuclear technology, right? And, that's, and again, what Dr. Octopus said, is he Octopus or Oc? I feel I'm calling him the wrong name. So. Well, it's Otto Octavius, isn't he? Octavius. But- why do you call him like, Dr. Octopus? I think he's he's sort of he's given that name by um what's the bloke that runs the Daily Bugle? J. Jonah so, James. Yeah. I, I think love he, I think he, he is the person that names all the superheroes and supervillains in my head anyway. <laughs> and I think because he had like four human limbs and four AI <laughs> nanowire limbs. The robotic yeah. grabby things. Yeah. He says it would be a cheap technology, but I don't think any nuclear, every nuclear technology requires like support in terms of the cost sides. It's not as cheap as other sources of energy, right? That's one of its big disadvantages. It's also quite interesting in, if you know, again, to compare it to nuclear fission is how there is a lot more collaboration. You know, nuclear fission is still largely kind of politically sensitive, kind of geopolitical, like this is our technology, the can-do reactor from Canada. Yeah literally has Canada in its name you know the UK AGR that they have that technology and then there's the other ones that I I can't remember but fusion seems to have become an international collaborative effort yeah definitely for sure I think there's a lot of collaboration fusion but still not enough I think it's there needs to be more especially from like developing countries and things like that I think it definitely needs to be more accessible to, to more people I think there's an issue with that even in fusion as well as fission so why do you think fusion is still always 30 years away is it just the lack of money going into it is it that we just haven't worked everything out or we don't have the right materials that's our palm of our hand yeah, that's a really good question. So I actually think that recently, until very recently, there hadn't been a lot of money in fusion, to be honest, compared to other technologies, other industries, compared to renewables. It was very much kind of scientific, academic kind of research. So it was quite small scale, despite these kind of large collaborations and things like that. But I think also the collaborative nature is great, but it also means things take a lot longer as well. I think when you have such big projects, it's really difficult. Like if you're making components in China and another component that's the same in India and another one in the EU, you getting them all to fit together with really low tolerances is a, is a real challenge speaking specifically about ETA and big you know any big multinational project like that I think is going to take a long time and then even with the companies there's just huge technical challenges along the way they've developed so much technology that's constantly spinning out into other kind of industries and things like that whether it's the robotics whether it's the super, superconductors so regardless I think it's a good investment just because the side side hustles that are, are created I didn't know what the right word was I'm 
just going to call it side hustles of fusion are really valuable to a lot of different parts of society but it is technically very challenging so I think that's why it's taken a long time hopefully with more investment now and more people getting trained up and, and working in it it can go faster. I think that's like the nature of research though if you knew exactly how things worked it wouldn't be called research would it so you always yeah. uncover things that you didn't expect or something else that he's looking into in more detail and I don't care what people say, the majority of discoveries, I'm sure they happen by accident. Or when you don't, you, when you do something you're not supposed to do. <laughs> like you can try for ages and ages and do everything by the book. And then one day you'll just forget to do something. And that's when you'll get your interesting result or, you know, something a bit more creative or different. <laughs> This is how you get Spider-Man supervillains because they fall into a vat of something or someone does an experiment there on someone they shouldn't have done. <laughs> yeah. mm. Speaking of things that people shouldn't do, I don't know if we want to broach this topic of weaponizing fusion because that was sort of where it came some of the research came from was looking at thermonuclear weapons you know first it was fission and coming up with the atomic bomb and then they came up with hydrogen bombs do we want to discuss that i think it's just unfortunate that the nuclear industry was becoming a thing that happened to coincide with the end world war i think a lot of scientists were like we're doing this to create electricity that will be so cheap you won't have to meter it was what was being said i think it's more it's a victim of circumstance that it's so strongly associated with nuclear weapons but i'll get down on my soapbox i think because other people have got different points of view no but i think i think it's obviously it's it's not great but i think it's important to remember that actually a lot of research comes from military applications across all industries and I'm not excusing it at all I think obviously nuclear weapons are terrible but even food I read this really interesting book I can't remember the name and it's going to really annoy me but it was like how a lot of the food that we eat now it came from like military research especially like the processed stuff so like cheese powder came from like military research in America back in the day they, they developed and so a lot of these companies they invested in the army to develop food that they could use like as rations and in return they were able to then market it and sell it because they owned the, the rights to it so a lot of these processed Processed foods came from like army stuff I think it was like combat ready food oh, I'm gonna find the name of the book because it's gonna annoy me but the point is is that a lot of industries regardless can either be used for good things or for bad things and I, I remember Ginwa sent one quote as well that it what was the quote um, oh it's about using like n- intelligence or knowledge for human good wasn't it yeah. Also, I found, I found the book Combat Ready Kitchen, How the US Military Shapes the Way You Eat. Really recommend it. It's a really interesting book. Interesting. Our quotation was, intelligence is not a privilege, it's a gift and use it for the good of mankind, they say in the film. I'm going to change it and say humankind. Humankind. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I think that's so true and so apt. Like regardless of whatever field you're working in, it can be used for for good and bad, right? And nuclear is no exception. And we should really take responsibility and make sure that we use it for for the good of humans because it is really a great technology in terms of generating electricity without releasing a lot of carbon. I think we need to use it for that. And it sounds like the the just the the number of people and the money required to make a technology like this or like gene editing or other things that are considered to be controversial someone would probably notice if someone was doing something nefarious right same with like we discussed the nanobots in james bond before Mm. christmas i think someone would probably notice if you were if you had some shady island somewhere where you were creating all these like poisonous things that could home in on an individual's dna yeah and it's so heavily regulated there's so many people checking how everyone's doing everything in in any kind of nuclear industry okay yes we've not mentioned this at all go on whack lyrical about what what got you interested into spider-man in the first place Nita? Um, great question so when i was little my mom somehow ended up getting this video from somewhere i don't know where from and it had these 1970s spider-man movies with i think nicholas hammond is the name of the, the actor who played spider-man and they anyone who's not watched them i think they're on youtube no one knows about about this movie like only the diehard spider-man fan. i'm not even a diehard spider-man fan but it's just because that's how i was introduced into it that was like started my love affair with, with spider-man they're just amazing they actually i think the science in them is a lot better than modern hollywood laura mentioned they basically show you a lot of nuclear technology in either the first one or the second one i think there were three i don't remember uh, i've only watched the first two. i only found those two on youtube after you mentioned them but yeah the second one there was a, a university professor or college professor because it's in america that had some plutonium in the lab and then like and the students were like oh that's really dangerous you can make a bomb out of that shall we steal it and prove how easy it is to make a bomb <laughs> <laughs> it was a different time it was a different time do you know what i mean <laughs> but the detail they went into into describing how they made this bomb was like oh 
I, I might be able to do that now. I don't have a microcontroller that would initiate the, the death of it. So I think from what I know, the way atomic weapons work is you need to create a critical mass, which depends on the geometry and the stuff around it as well. But you have like a small amount of plutonium and then a bigger amount of plutonium and the detonation forces the two together, which then releases a large amount of energy. All this from a Spider-Man movie, guys. <laughs> Would you get that today? No, you wouldn't. Don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I highly recommend those those movies, and I encourage everyone. Yeah, to watch I, them. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the most recent Spider Man. The I guess they're quite the far the home trilogy because it's all home and the titles aren't there. And I think my favourite line from that film is probably uh, MJ in the last film. There's a bunch of scientists, supervillains, whatever else, and just like they're in a wizard's dungeon. It's brilliant. This wizard that somehow does something with physics and controls universes. Wizard's dungeon. <laughs> I think that's how Hollywood approach to science. It's magic. It's not science. <laughs> but there's someone else who said it only seems like magic because they don't understand the science. So that's why they're in Hollywood. They can tell a story and not understand the science and it's magical. Maybe. I, I still think quantum entanglement sounds pretty magical, even though I, I kind of understand how it works. But making stuff, molecules and atoms on one side of the universe, is something that something else is doing here and now, that sounds pretty magical to me. Wormholes. <laughs> and I think that we'll just leave it there. <laughs> Did you have any anything else you wanted to say on this topic, Laura? Or wormholes is the last thing we're gonna say. Um, unless you want to try talking about how the spaceships and Star Trek work, but I don't think we do. So it was kind of, I thought that might be some fusion device in there somewhere. I also thought there must be fusion in there, but they never get into enough detail for us to ever figure out anything. All we know is there's a... Oh, I've forgotten the... Trilithium the, uh, crystals? Element that I think they mentioned was a tri- is it crystals. Trilithium, I think I remember them saying. Or dilithium? Yeah. And no, no, I think they upgraded from dilithium to trilithium, depending on which, which series Ooh, you're I'm watching. Confused. <laughs> So as far as we know, it's just a reactor and they dump the core when there's a problem and then they somehow magically make another one. I think that's what I liked about Star Trek. They didn't go into so much detail that you could sit there and go, oh, well, that wouldn't happen. And that's plainly silly. They just mentioned this stuff sort of in passing. And you go, yeah, okay. And I think that helps with the storytelling, doesn't it? That you're not going to get bogged down in that kind of detail because that's not what, you know, that it's just like a literal vehicle for their storytelling. Oh, it is a li- that's a great pun. <laughs> I love that. Did you do that on purpose? Like I half do them on purpose and half only realise it as I'm saying it that this is just so pun. deadpan the delivery. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> I think we should have the conversation there because I'm not going to stop laughing now. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, we've gone along all of the Spider-Man route and tried to work out whether or not the nuclear fusion technology that Doc Ock is talking about is anything like reality. I think Anika's kind of answered, no, it is not like what we see in the films. And, you know, for good things, for good things that the nuclear reactor that we've got isn't just going to randomly come out of control and take over Doc Ock's mind and he's going to just kill all of the people in whatever city they're in, New York. Yeah, so let's draw the conversation to a close. Find us on Twitter if you want to carry on this conversation. Leave a comment on the episode. Also, leave us a review of what you think of this podcast. And yeah, catch you next time. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.